Well, again, it's good to be here. I appreciate your welcome and your warmth, and uh, it's, it's, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning to lift up God's Word to you. Uh, just one preliminary, actually, as you uh, open up your Bibles, we're going to be uh, looking at Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. That's the Lord's Prayer section of the Sermon on the Mount. But as you do that, I just want to do one preliminary, because um, I don't get to do this at my home church. Um, this month is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I can't stand up in front of my church and say, hey, I think everybody should appreciate me. So why don't you join in? Yeah, tell me how awesome I am. Uh, money would be great. Um, I can't do that. Uh, but I can do that here this morning because I can do it in all sincerity to, know, to say that Scott has been a dear brother of mine for years. Uh, when we meet, we, we talk, we share struggles, we share joys, we pray together, we share ideas, and he is a dear brother. And I can just say this in all sincerity that you are very blessed to have Scott and Mandy their family lead you uh, in the worship of Jesus Christ, the lifting up his name, and the living it out in the gospel uh, day by day. And so may I just encourage you uh, to appreciate... <laughs> oh, this is exactly what I planned. <laughs> may I encourage you to appreciate Scott by just telling him once in a while uh, your appreciation, something specific, um, another way to appreciate him is I know that it would be a great encouragement to him is after on Sunday mornings you went up to him and said, hey, Scott, that point you made about this was really helpful because he'll know you're listening and care about all the work he puts in to preach the gospel to you week in and week out. So again, encourage you in that uh, to appreciate Scott and Mandy very much, as you well know that uh, she does a lot, not just up here, which is fantastic, but behind the scenes as well. Uh, so I just want to say that again, Scott's going to come down to Old North next week and do that here for me, uh, there for me, so. <laughs> I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate, I am a terrible cynic, um, and if, I will just say though, if you're here this morning thinking this is contrived or anything, uh, you need counseling, if you're cynical that, I, that Scott put me up to this, so this is sincere, off the cuff, not planned. Um, okay, well why don't we read God's Word, because this is why we're here, to be changed in front of God's Word, by changed by His Word, and then we will pray and uh, hear from God through his word. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for that your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. We thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we are but vessels. We are clay pots. Use us, Lord. Change us uh, from dirt to the shining radiance of your glory. Lord, calm our minds this morning as we have so many things, no doubt, that are fluttering in our lives from peripheral to significant to wonderfully joyful to very hard the things that come in our day, the rest of this day and the rest of this week, Lord. Um, we ask, Lord, that we will be now focused on your word and you. Thank you that you have promised that you're, you are with us through your Holy Spirit this morning. Thank you that you have promised that you indeed will use your word. It will not return void and that you indeed will change us and accomplish your great plan. And in this little congregation, in this little suburb, 
in this part of the world. Lord, may we be attentive. May we be honoring what we think about. And may you change us, Lord. And may we leave being hearers and doers of the word. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given it to us. And may we, Lord, honor you by listening carefully. We love you. We thank you. In your son's name we pray this. Amen. Now, my hunch is that probably everyone in this room has probably heard at least a portion of this passage that I just read. It's the Lord's Prayer, right? And I don't know about you. I'm not one for a participatory kind of thing. I never raise my hand when people ask me to raise my hand up front. But I am just curious. How many of you grew up saying the Lord's Prayer every week? Okay, about at least half of you, okay? So I wonder what you think, for any of you, those who said it every week or those who didn't, I wonder what you think about when you hear the Lord's Prayer. If you were to ask me this earlier in the summer, earlier in the summer when I, uh, before I really dove into this passage, Marty, what do you think about when you think about the Lord's Prayer? I will take you immediately back to the church I grew up in. And it was there at a very young age that I was led to believe, now I know this is the stuff jokes are made of, but it's true, I was led to believe that God had two names. And it was very confusing to me as a young boy. See, I wondered how God's name at the same time could be Art and Howard, right? <laughs> Our Father, who's Art in heaven, Howard be your name. <laughs> in all seriousness, I thought God's name was Art and Howard. And I wondered week after week how that could possibly be true. I thought Howard was a strange choice for God. Um, no offense to any Howards in here. Um, Anyway, that's what I thought about the Lord's Prayer, because we just said it every week. Um, maybe those of you who remember and didn't say it every week, you think of that's the prayer you pray maybe at funerals or weddings. I bet most of us, myself included, think of the Lord's Prayer is that nice, quaint prayer there in the Bible, in the Sermon on the Mount, that we, most of us just, just can rattle off our tongue. But what I want to do to you this morning uh, for you is just to put out there this idea and to encourage you not to stop being surprised by Scripture. Don't stop allowing Scripture to jolt you and surprise you because just about every time you think you know a passage or know a portion of Scripture and you go and say, okay, what is God saying? And really looking in it, God will always surprise you. And in this case, if you actually look at the Lord's Prayer, and I had the privilege to do this in preparing for this sermon, I can say that the Lord's Prayer confronted me and greatly challenged me. So if you were to ask me now, Marty, what do you think about when you think about the Lord's Prayer? I'd say something like this. The Lord's Prayer reminds me that I am indeed a great sinner who needs to repent and believe the gospel ever more thoroughly and faithfully. Is that what you think about when you think about the Lord's Prayer? Or to put it another way, I th when I think about the Lord's Prayer, I think that it puts me in a room of mirrors. Now that expression, a room of mirrors, is one I actually picked up from my Australian friends. The room of mirrors is the place, is an expression of a place you go to have a long, hard look at yourself. See, there's no place in the room of mirrors where you don't see yet another angle or another view of yourself coming back. And as you could probably guess, I am no fan of mirrors. I don't really like what I see from any angle. Right? And, and that's what the Lord's Prayer did for me, as I looked, really looked into it these last few weeks. It made me have a good, hard look at myself. And not just at my prayer life. Indeed, that's what it did. It certainly said, Marty, how's your prayer life compared to the Lord's Prayer? But it actually drilled down any deeper than that. It said, Marty, what are your deepest desires? What do you really value in life? All that came from looking at the Lord's Prayer. So let's use the Lord's Prayer this morning to do just that, to put us in a room of mirrors so that we can compare ourselves to the Lord and his prayer and in Lord's kindness really convict us and change us. So let's look at the first angle we may see when we look at the Lord's Prayer. And that in verses, that's in verses 5 through 8. And that's comparing our prayers as we see reflected against his prayer. Now, did you ever notice that the Lord's Prayer is actually a reactionary prayer, or a way to pray as opposed to other types of prayers? See, what's going on here is Jesus is pointing out two kinds of people that their prayers are not to be like. 
You'll notice there in verse 5, don't pray like the hypocrites. And you'll notice there in verse 7, don't pray like the Gentiles. So first of all, don't pray like the hypocrites. Verse 5, how do they pray? It was quite obvious there. They love to pray standing on the street corners, out loud in public using eloquent words. And notice here, it's very interesting that Jesus isn't warning against those people who don't pray, though those people should be warned. Jesus here is warning against those people who do pray, but don't really mean it. They don't really think anything important is going on beyond what you can see and hear. They're praying for the show of it, right? To get praise heaped upon them by the crowds. We know this how this feels, don't we, as Christians? Look at him. Listen to him. He's such a good prayer. She's so spiritual in the way she prays. These hypocrites love to appear to be talking to God when they pray, but in reality, they're just talking to humans, aren't they? Because that's what Jesus says. They'll get the reward from the ones who are listening, but they will get nothing from their heavenly Father. So Jesus here isn't just saying, hey, you better get praying because I know you don't pray enough. Jesus is here saying, actually, you better be sincere in your prayers. And that's why he safeguards, he, he recommends a safeguard to your sincerity when he commands you to go into the pri- prayer closet or the private room there in verse 6. And of course, this isn't a rigid prescription. Jesus himself didn't model only praying in private. But his point here is to make sure that whether you pray in private or in public, that you are praying for an audience of one, and that's God. Or maybe another parallel I think about in modern times, how often do we use our prayer talk? You know, you're meeting in the hallway afterwards, someone's telling you what a rough week they've had, and what do you say? Hey, let's commit that to prayer. I will surely pray for you on that. It appears so godly. It appears so sincere and so helpful. For, but how many times, maybe I'm just projecting, but how many times do we forget to pray? We go home and we move on with life and we never mention it in earnest and sincere prayer. Now you might say, well, Marty, that's not fair. I just forget. But as I was reviewing this this morning, thinking about this part, I couldn't help but think that every month, part of my uh, just kind of administrative work at my jobs, I have to submit an expense report to get reimbursed for all the expenses I put in my own credit card, get money back. And I tell you, I have never once forgot to submit that report. You know why? Because it's the values of my heart. But I admit to you, there are many times I've forgotten to pray. You know why? Because I wanted to be like the hypocrites. I wanted the person to say, man, I really appreciate that Pastor Marty who prays for me. I wanted to hear how much they appreciate me, but I actually don't believe I never forget to get my money back, but I do forget to pray. And I think that's what Jesus is reflecting here, is true, sincere prayer. Now, the second way the Lord's Prayer is a reactionary prayer, don't pray like them, comes in verse 7, is don't pray like the Gentiles. See, these Gentiles, as compared to the hypocrites, the Pharisees, they don't know God at all, and they're trying to impress some deity, any deity, with their elongated prayers, heaping word upon word. They spend hours in prayer hoping, just hoping that God will show them favor and do something good for them. Now, this might seem quite different than our landscape, but I think we actually buy into this more than we might initially think. How many times have we heard the stories of people who pray long hours? And we think about the Reformation. We're celebrating the 500th anniversary here in a few weeks. Think about Martin Luther's famous quote. He says, you know, I pray for an hour every day except when I'm really busy. Then I pray for two. And you just think, oh, why can't I be more like that? Or you hear of the the Christians in other parts of the world who are up on mountaintops praying for three hours every day, and because of that, revival has come. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with long prayers. In fact, it's great to have community with God in solitary, um, extended period of time. But notice what the Lord's Prayer, what Jesus says just before he teaches you to pray. He says, God knows what you need before you even ask him. You don't have to go heap word upon word and spend hours in prayer. He knows you're fully known come to him, coming to him. So Jesus is commanding straightforward, 
and simply put prayer requests because God knows. Isn't that relieving? Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is commanding here a prayers, prayers that are sincere and succinct, opening up the door for us to pray anytime, anywhere, even for a brief moment, no matter the situation. Jesus holds up this mirror to us and says, is this the way you think about prayer, the way I think about prayer? Angle one. Angle number two comes in verses 9 through 10. Our wants versus his wants, Jesus's. And this is where the Lord's Prayer really convicted me. It's the part of the room in the mirrors I was in that I realized I couldn't get out. My brother this summer actually went to a fun house, and he said, I had never been in a room of mirrors. <laughs> and he said, it's crazy. You don't think of it, but you, I actually could not figure out how to get out. I looked around, and I didn't know how. And that's why I felt as I looked into these two short verses here. Because as I read these verses of the Lord's Prayer, verses 9 through 10, I had to ask myself, Marty, what do you really, really want in life? Because it's here in these two verses I see what Jesus really, really wants with life. Now, we could probably spend a sermon on each of these phrases, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as is in heaven. You could break those up and spend weeks on them. There's so much depth and substance there. But for the sake of this morning, I just want to say that actually in one sense, Jesus is saying the same thing in many different ways. Jesus wants his great father's name to be hallowed. That's what he wants, really wants. That's the central theme of these two verses, verses 9 through 10. And to make sure we understand what that means, we probably should know what the word hallowed means. We never use that word. And I, again, I remember praying it each week growing up, and I had no idea what it means. And you can probably see in a footnote there, most of your Bibles may have a footnote, that says that the word hallowed just means to make holy. But what does that mean? Well, to make holy means to set something apart as different, as special, as precious, as great. So when Jesus teaches us to make our Father's name holy, he says, glorify yourself, Father. That's what I really, really want. It means that Jesus wants the name of the Lord to represent who he truly is. Wonderful creator, mighty counselor, almighty God. Revelation 4.11 encapsulates this well. The angels flying around singing or saying, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power because by your will you created all things. Right? To show how great and important this request is, in verse number 10, 9 and 10, Jesus repeats it a couple different times. He asks for the kingdom to come, you'll see there, and he asks for his will, the Lord's will, to be done. And as God's kingdom comes near in the life of Jesus Christ, we see God glorified the most, right? Jesus said, as great and wonderful as Jesus is, what did he say? Not my will be done, but yours. What did he say? Not for my glory, but for yours. Because when the kingdom, the true kingdom comes in, people are cared for, justice reigns, love rules, and everyone is glorifying the Father. What a great name he will have when that kingdom fully comes. And I think we can experientially grasp this in thinking how far we are from those days, right? As governments around the world run amok, every country in the world is looking for that great king or president or prime minister, someone who will come in and lead us better, someone who will come in and make everything right. And if that ever happened, wouldn't that person's name be heralded? Wouldn't that person's name be hallowed? There would be marches. There would be wonderful, wonderful songs written. People on earth would just joy, sing with joy that person's name because finally someone came in and led us well. But the Bible makes it very clear that that will never happen this time in this kingdom. The New Testament from beginning to end is clear that we are to yearn for the kingdom to come, for God to usher in his new kingdom, where the appointed king Jesus will reign. King Jesus. 
So when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you are praying for God's plan to come to its completion. It began with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're praying for the end of the world as we know it. You're praying for judgment day to come. When you pray verses 9 and 10 in the Lord's Prayer, you're asking that the end of the world will come so that a much better world will come in to replace it. And my question again is, do you want that? Is your grip on this world loose enough that you can sincerely pray this prayer? So back to my question. What do you really want? You know, the kind of moments when you're driving by yourself. I had had this happen as I drove up here yesterday, and you see the sign, I don't know, the Powerball, the Mega Millions, $140 million. You can't help but think, right? Boy, if I had that money, what you would do with it, what I would do with it showcases what I really want. A better house, a better body, a better whatever. The issue here in the Lord's Prayer unearths that question in us. What are my deepest wants? Now don't mishear me, friends. Prayer is a wonderful privilege for those who call upon the name of the Lord that they have a relationship with Jesus so much that he ushers them in to the throne room to be with the Heavenly Father. And in being in that throne room, we can have full confidence, as Hebrews says, to call upon him at any time, with any request, about anything, casting all our anxieties and our petitions upon him, as we read in the New City Catechism. But Jesus here, in the great prayer that he teaches his disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer, showcases what kingdom-minded Christians really want. The glory of God's great name. Simply put, the Lord's Prayer shows us what we should be asking for. So as we stand in this room of mirrors, I think, I think that we stand here worried as we look at all the angles. And we probably have to admit to ourselves this morning, at least I will admit to you and confess just how worldly I am when I look back in the reflection. As a whole, when I listen to the prayer requests of the church back in Youngstown, I see a dire lack of want for the great name of the Lord to be hallowed. Sure, we hear requests for, really boils down to three things, health, finances, or job, and children. And I'm not suggesting to take those away, but what I'm suggesting is as I see a virtually no request for the glory of the Lord to be revealed, for my life to be changed, the sin to go away, so that... People look on, and as Matthew chapter 5 says, they will glorify the Lord in heaven because of your good works. And as individuals, I will stand up here and confess my own culpability in this problem and see a grave similarity to my deepest wants and desires to that of the world. Comfort, happiness, middle class opportunity and success for my children, and the list goes on. So I'm in this room of mirrors, and I have to ask myself, do I really want what he wants? Two short verses. Do my prayers reflect the prayers of King Jesus who taught me to pray? Well, third angle, our third angle, verses 11 through 15. If verses 9 through 10 are the sincere desires of our heart, then we should pray for our part in it. So verses 11 through 15 reinforce the prayer of 9 through 10 by asking God to help us live out our beliefs that we want his name to be hallowed above all other things we could ask for. So verse 11, you see there, give us this day our daily bread. Well, we don't have the time to explore this somewhat tricky verse there. There are two main thoughts about what this passage means. The one's kind of the obvious according to how it looks here. And as we just ask God for the basic needs to keep going, to live for him, right? But I think in context of the Sermon on the Mount, I just wonder if this is correct. Because if you just go later on in Matthew chapter 6, it says, Don't be anxious about what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added upon to you. See, if you drop down in your footnotes, I don't like to do this because I'm certainly not casting doubt in God's word, but there is a literal translation in verse 11 there, and that is to say, give us today the bread for tomorrow. 
And this ex- wording is explicit. It takes us back to the deep roots of God's people in the Old Testament, where the promises of tomorrow, the promises of the promised land, the future, that's what guided them and motivated them to live for the kingdom. One author put it this way, Could it be to ask to be given today's, today the bread of tomorrow is to ask for the blessings of the coming kingdom? This fourth request, then, is another request for the kingdom to come. It expresses a longing for bre- the bread and abundance of the next age, rather the uncertain and fading wealth of this age, which is so prone to rust and decay and theft. So we participate. Our part in the hallowing of God's name is to ask God to give us what we need to hold on to the promise that he will indeed hallow his name fully one day. Give us the bread for tomorrow, the bread of life. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Lord, give us the bread for tomorrow so that we can keep going for your kingdom to come. Then there in verses 12, and then verses 14 and 15, I think, kind of come in under verse 12, is this idea of forgiveness. To hallow God's name means that we must ask for forgiveness from ourselves. Forgiveness for the many, many, many times we seek to hallow our own name or lift up our own agenda. The many times we participate happily in this dark world trying to build our own kingdom instead of living for God's. And so we ask for forgiveness for ourselves, but we also ask for forgiveness for others. Because there is no way our desire for God's kingdom can showcase itself if we're unforgiving people. And here's the logic of verses 12 and 14 and 15. As I said earlier, when I pray for God's kingdom to come, your kingdom come, I am praying for judgment, the end of the world to come. I want an end to this evil and rebellious world and those who perpetuate the defaming of God's name. But if I'm praying for judgment, then I must pray for forgiveness because I'm very much a part of that evil, unbelieving world at times, at least in my actions, of defaming God's name. And if I pray for forgiveness for myself, surely I have to pray for forgiveness for others. In other words, the question may beg us is, are you a justice person or are you a mercy person? You know, a justice person walks around and it's like, everyone should get what they deserve. And we make sure we do that, especially when we talk politics or world affairs. It's interesting, though, if, for those justice people out there that they're not quite asking for full justice, because I haven't met a justice person yet who says, well, I want what I deserve. It always quite stops short there, doesn't it? But if you're a mercy person, you'll get without explanation, I think, verses 12, 14, and 15. If you've come to grips with the gravity of your own sin and God's merciful pardon on your own life, then you can't help but be a mercy person towards other people. This is the way of the kingdom, Jesus says. Be a mercy person. And you could spend the rest of this day and this week and this month applying verse 12, 14, and 15 to the many relationships you have. Am I a justice person or am I a mercy person? The way of the kingdom, the only way into the kingdom is mercy. Justice will come, but God through Christ will dispense that. And then we have verse 13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This request is similar to the other requests. If we want God's name to be hallowed, we, want, we don't want to continue in sin and evil or indifference towards God, do we? By praying this request, we are telling God that sin is so much ingrained in our own lives that we can't see it or avoid it without his fatherly help. I was teaching a class on the Reformation at our church. I was teaching on, uh, by grace alone. And a man came up to me afterwards and said, Marty, I, okay, I get this grace thing. You know, we do our best. We try to do our best. But it's great to know that grace is out there. And when we need it, we can apply it. 
I think, oh, I'm a horrible teacher. That's exactly not what grace is. <laughs> grace fuels even our good efforts, our good works, all by the grace of God. I think we all sometimes default to be moralists, that we do try to do good, and then there's God to patch us up. No, sin is so ingrained in our lives that we need the grace to see it, we need the grace to overcome it, and we need the grace to persist in doing the good works he has prepared for us. Lord, please let me not value sin, is what verse 13 is saying. Lord, lead me away from evil and to yourself. Lord, make your righteousness so attractive that it's that's what I desire more than anything else. So by praying verses 9 through 13, we're really praying the gospel, aren't we? That's what the Lord's Prayer is. It's forgiveness and God-centeredness. That's what the gospel is, isn't it? Lord, forgive me for being a rebellious sinner and make me centered on you and your plans and your ways. By praying verses 11 through 15, we're asking God to take away the idolatry of this kingdom and the taste we have for this world and give us a dire yearning for his kingdom to come. So what do we do with this Lord's Prayer? I hope it's clear by now that it's a wonderful prayer, but it's a hard prayer. So may I encourage you, let the Lord's Prayer put you in the room of mirrors. Examine your desires, your wants. Plead with God to change you. Not just to pray more like his son, although that's part of it, but to desire the things of the son. And certainly may I encourage the, all of you to use the Lord's Prayer. Pray it. Just make sure you know that you're pr- what you're praying and actually believe it so we don't fall into the temptations of verses 5 through 8. It's not a magic set of words. I probably don't need to say that in this audience, but it's not a magic set of words that get you what you want when you pray it enough unless what you want is God's name to be hallowed. Then it will guarantee to fulfill its promise. So don't shy away from praying it. It's a simply wonderful uh, prayer that you can pray in 52 words or less, depending on your translation, that reminds you of the gospel, the coming kingdom, our role in living for God, and his great glory. Praying the Lord's Prayer is praying about the matters that really matter as Christians. It forces me, at least, outside of my own little world, with all my anxieties and worries of the weeks and days and months and years to come, and forces me to pray for the kingdom to come. And to reshape, then, my life after that. It forces me to pray beyond the here and now and for the great eternity, the hope that we have. The Lord's Prayer changes us bit by bit into the likeness of the Lord himself. To the praise of our Father's name in heaven, hallowed be his name. Let's pray. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive those debts against us. Give us our daily bread, Lord, so that we will hold on to your promises. Lord, deliver us from the evil one. Lord, take away the taste of sin. Lord, make your name great. In my life, in the life of all those here, in the life of every Christian around the world, and indeed in this creation, Lord, make your name great. And indeed, come again to end this misery and shameful world attempt to build its own kingdom. Lord, we sit and stand here or sit here uh, 
confessing to you, Lord, how hard it is to pray a prayer like that, knowing, Lord, how hard it is to let go of this world. Our hopes, our aspirations, whether for ourselves or for our children or grandchildren or friends, Lord, run so deep. Lord, may our hopes be your, your hopes, your son's hope for this world. May our children and friends and all the endeavors we're involved in, Lord, serve to lift you up in how we live and how we talk, what we dream about, what we do. Lord, bless this congregation with a growing sense of the yearning for your kingdom. Bless this congregation, Lord, with a growing love of your ways as opposed to the world. Lord, bless this congregation with a sincere approach to you, knowing that you love them as a heavenly father and want to listen and want to bless. Let everyone in this room, Lord, run to you in prayer regularly this week, this month, this year. And Lord, let us all, Lord, be conformed to the image of your great son, Jesus, who taught us this great prayer. Change us, Lord. Forgive us. We thank you. Amen.